We know what modern university lecture halls often look like. Hundreds of students in one room, sometimes feeling disconnected from their professor and sometimes their material as well. Steve Jordans thinks he has a solution to this problem. Let's find out what it is. Here he is, Steve Jordans, professor of psychology on the University of Toronto's Scarborough campus. We welcome you back to TVO. Thank you. It's great to be back. Some people who've got really good memories will remember that you uh, partook in the best lecturer competition from a few years ago. I did. And yes. I, uh, I, how'd you do, incidentally? Always a bridesmaid. <laughs> Always a bridesmaid. No, I, th I think I finished second twice, top 20 once, and top 30 once. So. Silver medal is absolutely acceptable. Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> okay, and Stephen, just before we get started with our interview, I do want to play some tape off the top. This is you from the 2010 best lecturer competition showing everybody what it is that you do. Roll tape, please. So students in our class uh, originally submit an assignment, as they would in, in many other cases, but then they log back onto the system. And what we're showing you here is when they do so, they see their uh, assignment up top, and then they see below that six anonymously presented assignments uh, written by their peers. And so what we ask them to do is to read through those, kind of think of which one they feel is better than, than another, so rank order them in their mind, uh, and then translate that into both a rating of the quality of the piece, something positive about the piece, and something that could have been done better. Okay, that's the video evidence. Just give us the, uh, the general introduc introductory lay of the land of what you were trying to achieve with that. Sure. Uh, when I had inherited that class, it was one of those huge lecture halls you're talking about. At, at that point in time, I think it was about 1,200 students um, that we teach using what's called a blended learning strategy. So I'm videotaped as I teach. Students either come to class or they watch online. So a very big classroom. And uh, at that time, it was assessed 100% multiple choice. And that was really the thing that bothered me, because it, it gave the impression to students that university was about memorization. Hmm. And although I research memory, I don't think that's all there is to the world. Uh, and so I really wanted them to be writing and thinking and being critical and learning to provide feedback to peers, receive feedback, react appropriately. So that's really what Peer Scholar was designed to do, to go into this large lecture hall and use the community that I had to try to enrich the learning experience any way I could. 1,200 is completely unsatisfying, I guess, right? It's, it's 1,900 now. It's 1,900 now? Yes. The class size is 1,900. Yeah, yeah, which people have that reaction. But you know, I, I think if you talk to any of my students, they would say it's a warm 1,900. <laughs> <laughs> well, OK, make the distinction for us. How is it a warm 1,900 where before it was just an overcrowded, impossible 1,200? Well, <laughs> uh, I, I think one of the things, so, let me just say, Peer Scholar really is just harnessing things we already know that works, uh, primarily from the school system. So the core of it is what's called peer assessment, whereby um, you may submit a piece uh, of a composition, or it could be even a lecture that you've recorded with your iPhone, whatever it is. You record something, and students now give you feedback. Um, as they're giving you feedback, you're giving your fellow students feedback. And then ultimately, you're allowed to now revise your work based on the feedback you got from your peers. So we try very hard to keep everybody very constructive and yet still be analytical and critical. Um, and so suddenly it feels to students like their fellow students are helping them to do a better job at whatever task they've been given. And uh, we've actually shown that this enhances the sense of community in a very palpable way. Thus, a warm 1900. Warmer anyway. Warmer anyway, OK. <laughs> yes. uh, Dwayne Perry. Your yes. partner in crime in this thing. Yes. How long were you guys working on Pure Scholar? We um, have been working with it for close to 10 years now. Um, when he first worked with me as an undergraduate, this is when I had inherited the class, and, and he heard me gripe many times about wanting to get writing into the class. And it was, I think, literally, we have trouble recreating the past, but I think it was actually his idea to try to have create a system that harnessed peer assessment and self-assessment. We also ask students to uh, assess themselves. Um, but he thought we could create a system that would do this, that would work with very large numbers, and we set about doing that. And that became his PhD thesis. So it was really um, a kind of a, a nice triangulation whereby we were building this, doing research on it to ensure that it really did do the things we expected it to do, honing it along the way. Uh, and so we end up both with a, a PhD thesis for him, uh, a lot of publications and presentations, um, but also now a product that's having a pretty large impact. And you see the things you expected it to do. What did you expect it to do? Well, a, a lot of those are tied to what uh, most educators would now call learning outcomes. Uh, and specifically, 
of course we want to teach students knowledge. So in my introductory psychology class, I want to teach them the, the important figures, the phenomenon, the experiments, all that kind of stuff. But in addition to that, we really also want to teach our, our students skills. Um, and you teach skills in a very different way. So skills like critical thinking, creative thinking, um, self-reflective thought, the, the ability to analyze our own work and, and see the flaws in it. Which multiple um, choice really wouldn't cover, would no, it? No, multiple. You, you can do some great things with multiple choice in terms of assessing understanding at a deep level, but it's always focused on content. Um, but, but a skill like just writing or communicating effectively, that's only learned through repeated effective practice. Mm. And that's been the challenge in a very large lecture hall. In a small lecture hall, you can keep asking students to do things, and you have five or six papers to grade. But when it's 1900, then suddenly the stresses make that difficult. Mm -hmm. uh, and so this was our way of, of trying to give students those skills, strengthen them in that context, so that when they leave, and they're around a boardroom or around their family, I sometimes say, I'm, I'm teaching you how to argue with your future daughter. Well, because you will need to know how to do that. Um, it's just general life skills. And you know, I think that's as an important role for university as the content. We would really like, hence the name scholar, we would like our students to graduate as scholars so they both have the information, but they also have the skills to use it well. And how many classes at U of T are using Peer Scholar now? Now it's well over 20 and, and growing. Because Is this we're, 20 at Scarborough only or? No, uh, across the campus. Across the U of T. Across okay. U of T. But, and it really ranges from things like uh, we're training medical residents. It's being used to train medical residents. It's being used in sociology, psychology, astrophysics. Um, so really across the board, which is the other heartening thing for us. Because uh, Peer Scholar really um, structures a process, but it's what we sometimes call content agnostic. So, you know, what students are actually thinking about and what topic area they're in is free to vary. Uh, and that's what's really nice, because they can learn critical thinking in the context of psychology, but then go on to a very different kind of class, but be employing those same skills in now a new, slightly different context. And that's a really good way for them to generalize those skills. You're in Centennial College, too? Uh, we are, yeah. There's, there's a really interesting example in Centennial College. They, the ambulance, the, the people they train to be ambulance workers, part of their um, training is to do a, a cultural awareness project whereby they pick some culture in Toronto. And the goal is to say, well, if you were going into a home um, that was of that culture, what should you know about that culture in order to have a respectful, uh, efficient interaction? So you know, if a father is, is having some trauma, you don't want to be offending the people around you. You want to be able to do what you have to do. So in the past, students would pick one culture and learn about it, talk about it, write some sort of composition. Now they still do that, but now they help assess four or five or six of their peers' work. Uh, and in so doing, they learn about four or five or six different cultures. So it really kind of broadens as well the learning that's going on. I would presume, I mean, th th a decade ago, this was pretty much unheard of, I presume. I wonder how much skepticism you have to overcome in order to get this into the places you want to get it into. Well, it, less than you'd think. But I did learn that for the first one. The, the very first time I used it in my class, um, I did not do a well enough job soapboxing, I would call it now. You know, spending a good 15 minutes to a half an hour explaining to my students why I was asking them to do this, what I hoped they would gain from it. But it literally takes that. It takes 15 or 20 minutes and they get it. They understand what you're trying to do. And we've done a lot of work with students afterwards doing surveys and it, it's very heartening. They do get it. They endorse that they're learning a lot, that they're applying what they learn to themselves um, and the skills that they highlight are exactly the skills we're hoping to target. So. Mm. Yeah, you got some good. award a few years ago, right? For this, what was that? Um, well, in two thousand nine, we won the National Technology Innovation Award, which is very, very heartening. From the uh, Learning Partnership, so they're uh, just mm, yeah. sort of an independent body that looks at new technologies that they think are effective. And so, yeah, that was that was very. Nice. And what did that do to the trajectory of acceptance that you're? Well, the, the really neat thing is. They give this award at multiple levels of the education system, and they bring the winners together for a mini conference. And, and at that conference, we presented Peer Scholar, which until that time was really a higher education tool. But because this audience was so varied, uh, there were a lot of people from the school system who became very excited. Uh, and that spawned a school version of the same product, which is now being used in well over 200 schools. Uh, it's called Cognito. Um, and it's the same idea, again, because of its content agnostic, you can just bring it into a grade 8 classroom. or And I think we could go a lot lower, but so far it's 8 through 12. Well, actually, the, the, the next segment of our discussion is entitled, Peer Scholar Goes Incognito. <laughs> <laughs> there we go. But just a, a 
flush that out a little more if you would. Cognito is different from Pure Scholar, how? Well, you know, in many ways it's not, it's not very different. It's the same core process of having students, and, and, and let me highlight this because I think it's a very important point. We have a class full of students that we ask to do some, some project. In the traditional approach, a typical student knows their own work and eventually they see their own work back with a grade. But there's this wealth of other work that could give a much more palpable signal to the students than their grade. If, if I submit something and I see what five of my peers did, and they're all doing much better than I am, I can feel that. I don't need a C or I don't need a D. I can actually feel like these guys are doing better. So that palpable understanding of, of how you're doing and how your progress is relative to your peers is something that can help at, at every, every level. We actually hope to kind of push it even down further to grade one or grade two. We have this notion of something called Piraboo in our mind. Wait, say it again, Piraboo. Piraboo? How are you spelling that? Well, it's, it's like Peekaboo, but P-E-R. Um, so, so the same idea that even, you know, for example, a young child could be asked to draw a picture of their teacher. And it could be stick man figures, could be anything. But they could now look at how their peers are doing and again be exercising critical thought. Why is that one better? What's that person doing that I'm not doing? It's a much more experiential form of learning, much more palpable form of learning, and it kind of takes the emphasis off the marks a little bit more and puts it back on the quality of the work. Hmm. Maybe you could help us understand this, because I know a number of years ago I, I did a story on something called License to Learn, which was a peer tutoring organization. Ah, There's yeah. something about the peer-to-peer -peer relationship that is different from the teacher to student relationship, yeah. which you would think would be the best relationship in terms of learning, that can be superior, the peer-to-peer the yeah. -peer relationship. Yeah. Well, what is that? I think I'd equate that to you know, learning from your older brother versus learning from your father. If, if somehow if the separation gets far enough, you can very, I think Mark Twain said something like when he was 14, his father seemed to be a very ignorant man that he didn't want to be around. But by the time he was 21, it was amazing how much his father had learned. Um, so literally, yeah. I think there's that perception that, that if there's enough of a gap, then the person really has to work hard to, to get across that gap. Whereas somebody who's been where you are just a year or two ahead, you know, that person, you can, you can take their knowledge more. Speaks the same language in some respects, I guess. Speaks the same language, lived in the same world. You, you don't get the sense that the, the rules of that person may not apply anymore. You, hmm. you get the sense that they do. What's the feedback from uh, teachers and parents regarding Cognito so far? Uh, so far, very good. Um, we, we've just uh, published a paper, actually, where we, we looked at that explicitly. Um, teachers have been using this sort of peer uh, assessment for a while, but they've used it in a very different way, and, and they can really feel the difference. So in, when it was done in the schools before, you might write something, I might write something, and we, we might swap papers. But we'd be like face-to-face -face swapping papers, and then we'd be assessing each other, but we'd be really nice to each other because we're right here and we'd give good marks. In these systems, everything's done anonymously, and it's done on a wider scale. So you're seeing four or five peers, you're comparing them and reacting to them. Uh, and so it seems as though students are being much more honest. The marks are in line with what um, people would expect, not that those marks, I mean, ultimately a teacher is going to be the one providing the grade on the whole assignment. Uh, but it really seems, teachers say, to be a much more honest, productive process where people are giving each other more useful feedback. I think it's 2009, you did a study in which you kind of looked for where's the sweet spot here? What's the number yes. of peer yeah. assessments where you finally hit the right critical mass? Yeah. The number you said was six. How right. come? Well, the, the, so there's two ways to use the system, and one way is where you actually allow the grades that peers give to, to be the grades that count. Um, and the nice thing about that system is it allows you to do many writing assignments, even in very large classes. But in that system, you want to be sure that that average peer grade is something you can believe in and trust. And so literally, if you average enough noisy numbers, you get a pretty non-noisy number. But the question is always how many. And so we compare directly. Um, let me say it this way. If you looked at how, how well one peer predicted another peer's grade, they weren't very good, about 0.2. Where if, if you looked at graduate students, if a graduate student graded a piece, how much did that agree with another graduate student? They were around 0.5 on this scale that goes from 0 to 1. So graduate students know more than undergraduates, which is better. good. Yeah. But if you averaged five or six um, mm -hmm. undergraduates and then correlated them with a graduate student, they were just as good as another graduate student. So it was literally once you got to that, around that five or six number, uh, the average of those five or six grades seems to be as reliable and as accurate as the, as the number from a single teaching assistant. Do you know why? 
Well, I mean, it's just, that's just a general truth about um, numbers. So if we had one of those bowls of candy um, gumballs, mm -hmm. and they said how many are in there, and we, we could each guess, and we'd be off. If we asked 50 people to guess, and we looked at the average, that average would tend to be really accurate. Hmm. It's just a statistical uh, fact. As Cronkite would say, that's, that's the way it is. That's the way it is. Okay. <laughs> yes. What kind of student, describe the student to me, gets the yeah. most out of this kind of thing? Well, the one that gets the most is the one that A, w wants to, which is always true. So somebody who's very open to the feedback um, and, and looking at it uh, in a very honest way. But generally, it's the students on the, on the sort of lower end of the spectrum. Uh, if I kind of reverse the question and said which students are perhaps finding it least interesting or least uh, impactful, it's the very high end ones because they're not, get, they're not learning as much from the feedback. They're already very high performing. So they feel a little bit more like they are helping their peers. Um, but for the most part, they're very comfortable with that too. And they are still getting the signal that, yeah, I'm doing pretty well relative to my peers. But anybody who's not at that highest level will tend to get something out of the, out of the process. And the, the kind of lower down they are, the more they get out of the process, hmm. as long as they they keep their ears open and, and their mind open. Can you cheat? Well, I mean, as much as you can cheat on, I guess, any essay, although I almost want to take that back. So one of the aspects of, uh, that we suggest with this program is that rather than having a long, drawn-out essay, you ask students to create a very idiosyncratic argument about some topic. Um, and, and I will constantly change these topics. So as one example, when gang violence was a big issue in Toronto, uh, I said, you're in introductory psychology. Uh, if you had to make a suggestion to the mayor about something that wasn't just take the guns off the street or longer prison terms, something a little more complex and interesting than that from what you learned, what would you suggest and why would you suggest it? So within Peer Scholar, we ultimately want them to create short, efficient, powerful pieces. And I like arguments because they exercise critical thought. Um, so in that way, I mean, you can always get somebody else to write your paper for you. Uh, and this does not get around that, but you know, neither does a traditional essay. Right. But beyond that, by choosing topics that are much more idiosyncratic and much more related to the context and the times, I try to make that, I, I try to make it so they can at least grab something that's already pre-made uh, online. One of the things we're learning, we're doing this Learning 2030 series here, yeah. uh, Learning to the Year 2030, we're discovering that- It's fantastic, the by the way, well, thank pre you. Appreciate hearing that. <laughs> The role of the teacher is changing from one of authority who knows everything, stands yeah. on a mountaintop and you know, dispenses wisdom, yeah. to kind of facilitator of students making their own way, learning it their own way. It is, yeah. Uh, does this do that too? Yeah, that, that's certainly the goal. The goal is much more on developing cognitive skills, uh, de developing that, that keen eye, because as we like to say now, it used to be that the professor was almost the curator of knowledge. They had mm -hmm. read this vast literature. They boiled it down to the critical stuff that they were presenting the student. Knowledge is now so ubiquitous. You, know, you don't need a, a nice book collection somewhere that nobody else has to have access to it. Just about everybody has access to everything. Mm -hmm. So it's almost less about knowledge and more about how well you're able to use the knowledge, because a lot of the knowledge is not good, a lot of the knowledge on the internet. So you have to know how to uh, detect what's high quality and what's low quality, um, how to combine information in unique and creative ways. And so those are the skills we're really trying to exercise, uh, for lack of a better term, because that really is what we're doing. One last thing, games. games. Almost every fun thing on a computer these days has got to have a game angle. Yeah. Have you? Um, well, not, not so much with the Peer Scholar. And other things in the classroom we do, there, there are times it's an interesting, we've got ourselves in a weird situation in the education system where we've made marks the primary goal of every learning process. And, and I think to some extent, if we can back away from that or if we can find ways of making other things the focus, then we can. So in the class in general, we are moving towards gamifying, as they call it, but largely giving students what are called conscientiousness points <laughs> for doing behaviors that um, really help others in the class and really kind of reflect what we think a good student would do. So an idea of getting assignments in on time, perhaps going over uh, above and beyond uh, in terms of giving comments to students to really help them improve their work, and you know anything like that if we can give them conscientiousness points, and then ultimately the top people might get a letter where we just kind of say, hey, this was a student that really, really you know, seemed to put in the right effort and do the right things. Then when they go applying for research work or something like that in labs, they have something to show. So it's a, it's a mix of 
just trying to reward the right behaviors without putting a mark on everything. Right. We don't want to say do this because I'll give you 1%. We'd like to say do this because I'll recognize that. And if you do enough of these good things, then I will help you. You know, you will have shown me you're the right kind of student, and I will therefore try to help you have good experiences. Gamifying. Gamifying. That's a new word for me today. Yeah, no, okay. it's very common. Always it's happy to learn it. something new on this program. Yep. Steve Jordan is professor of psychology, U of T Scarborough campus, the co-creator with Dwayne Paré of Peer Scholar, and of course a finalist at the TVO Best Lecturer Competition in 207 and 210, but we're not going to dwell on that. <laughs> Thanks <laughs> Thank a lot for coming in tonight. Thank you, Steve. Support Ontario's public television. Donate at TVO.org.